How was Starship's second attempt at orbit? What went incorrectly? In what shape is the launch pad now in? How successful was this, and did the deflector make it? Welcome to Spaceverse, your portal to the wonders of the universe. Today, we're diving deep into the cosmos to unravel the mysteries behind SpaceX's groundbreaking mission, the second Starship in Flight Test 2 or IFT-2. But before we dive into the details, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you never miss out on the latest space discoveries and updates. All right, let's get started. Dispatches from the Starship. The unexpected has taken place. A little over seven months after the first Starship's grandiose attempt to reach orbit ended in a rocky tornado, the second Starship launched and surpassed everyone's expectations. Or did it? First, let's back up and examine our path to the present. Ship 25 and Booster 9 were loaded and ready to go for weeks before SpaceX finally lifted off. The main snag was the launch license, which was anticipated but never received. On November 15, the Fish and Wildlife Services issued their official assessment of the deluge system recently installed at Starbase. In conclusion, there will be no major effect on the environment. We'll get into the document's many interesting specifics shortly. Following this change, the FAA immediately released its re-evaluation of the 2022 environmental assessment for Starship and subsequently approved the updated launch license. SpaceX finally obtained the go-ahead they had been waiting for even if the license only covered their second mission. They replied by setting the November 17th launch window for only two hours. Did it come out on that day? No. A day before the scheduled attempt during grid fin testing, SpaceX discovered damage to one of the four actuators responsible for manipulating them. This necessitated a restart so that the malfunctioning part could be swapped out. SpaceX decided to replace not just the broken actuator, but also two more just in case. It wasn't too long before we got another shot at it. The new launch window was scheduled for the 18th, although it would only be 20 minutes long due to the arrival of a cruise liner later that day. All the thrills were certain. Only in the event of an extremely significant car malfunction necessitating a protracted stay would the limited duration of that window be an issue. The standard operating process for Starship testing was in full effect on the 18th, with Boca Chica Village evacuated. The road closed, and the launch pad emptied of all people. After then the orbital tank farm started up, and began to gradually cool down all propellant lines. This is necessary to prevent thermal shock when the fluids are pushed through at maximum flow. Two hours before D0 SpaceX's flight director gave the green light to begin fueling the prototype. Starting with the Super Heavy booster, propellant was pumped into the fueling system and then into the ship. SpaceX began their live broadcast 35 minutes before launch providing us with additional information. Clearing the tower and achieving flight was the major goal of the first flight. This should serve as your first clue into the mystery of a successful launch. The goal of this operation was to put the new hot staging system through its paces and gather as much information as possible. Everything else was just a cherry on top. SpaceX has also released an official animation depicting the new technology, but it can't compare to seeing it in action. The live broadcast continued with the addition of everyone's favorite host John Ensprocker. As the clock wound down, his presence elevates these operations to a new level. An intriguing fact was revealed before liftoff. Starlink would be used for the first time to transmit video and information from a rocket. As the rollout progressed, it became apparent that the video components weren't going to work. The initial phase of fueling and engine chill went successfully. The thrust vector control system test was then captured in all its glory by a camera installed beneath the launch deck. It took place about 90 seconds before liftoff. Rather than using hydraulic pistons for TVC as in previous flights, the Super Heavy booster has switched to electronic actuators. Hydraulic systems rely on fluid flow and are prone to leaks and fires. Not the best conditions for sending a rocket into space. In contrast, electric TVC makes each engine stand on its own in the event of a malfunction saving weight and increasing reliability. At the T-42nd mark, a special part of Starship's launch procedure kicked in. The design allows for a halt in the countdown holding up to 30 minutes. This stall can be used for a number of things, from keeping an eye on engine temperatures to waiting for tank pressures to stabilize. This is in contrast to the Falcon 9 launch procedure in which a delay in the countdown causes the launch time to be reset by several minutes. So did they use this hangar for the second Starship launch? In a word, yes, 
There was initial fear that boats entering the restricted zone would slow down the countdown, but this turned out to be unnecessary. The actual issue was low pressure in the upper stage fuel tanks, identical to the scenario during the previous launch, which also encountered a hold for this reason. But that's why there are holds in the countdown, so that problems like this can be dealt with calmly and in no particular hurry. After nearly two minutes, the countdown resumed sending our anticipation into an orbit above Mars. The deluge system kicked in seconds before ignition. The Raptors started up and then blast off. The second orbital Starship launch went off without a hitch, and like the first, we witnessed the rocket clearing the tower at a little slant. To avoid crashing into the tower, the Starship may have slightly jimbled some of its engines, resulting in the apparent angle. A call from Mission Control at T plus 50 seconds indicated that power and telemetry were normal and everything went according to plan. This phase strikingly contrasted the original Starship launch, no explosions, no onboard burns, and correct fuel use. The largest mock diamonds ever created were formed by the rocket, and their pure clear flame was an indication of how well the flight was going. To emphasize how dissimilar this launch was from the first flight, let's look back at the first minute. In the first attempt, four engines had already failed, the rocket was going 675 kilometers, about 420 miles, per hour, and the height was somewhere in the neighborhood of 5 kilometers, about 3 miles. This time around every engine worked perfectly. To put it in perspective, that's the equivalent of 718 miles per hour and 9 kilometers, 5.6 miles, in altitude. Both the speed and height are nearly doubled. That's a big change that demonstrates how much progress has been made. At T plus 106 seconds, one of the flight's most crucial moments occurred. The point of maximum aerodynamic pressure, often known as Max-Q. At Max-Q, the rocket experiences its greatest mechanical stress and any serious defects in the design are usually exposed. Starship, however, breezed right through it and into the clear sky above SpaceX's starbase. The second Starship had already surpassed its predecessor's peak speed by T plus 130 for seconds. However, the combination of Booster 9 and Ship 25 continued to fly strongly and steadily while the first Starship was beginning to lose control. The visually striking pattern of the engines shutting down in sets of five began at T plus 239 seconds. You may be asking why we're doing things in such a roundabout way. One possible cause is SpaceX preventing a phenomena called as water hammering or hydraulic shock. 3D Raptor 2 engines require a mass flow of 19,500 kilograms or 43,000 pounds per second to maintain thrust, with each engine consuming roughly 650 kilograms or 1,400 pounds of propellant per second. Stopping this flow quickly could generate a surge of pressure within the fuel lines, potentially inflicting significant damage. The risk can be reduced by shutting down the engines in waves. It's also possible that this strategy may be used to keep the thrust evenly distributed, regardless of when the engines are turned down. According to Elon Musk's tweet, after shutting down most of the engines, the three that remained will reduce their thrust to half. However, after analyzing the launch footage's brightness, we came to the conclusion that SpaceX maintained the engines at their maximum thrust for some reason. At T plus 244 seconds, the most anticipated time following ignition arrived. Three vacuum-optimized engines fired up, and then three atmospheric raptors were turned on. This represented a major milestone for the mission, as it was the first time all six ship engines had been ignited while in flight. Ultimately, the sizzling staging was successful the model split up. SpaceX also confirmed a key element of this maneuver right before liftoff. The central engines were repositioned as had been suspected, so that they would not fire directly at the dome. From that point onwards things are escalating swiftly, so we'll have to scrutinize the movie virtually frame by frame. Almost soon after stage separation, the surviving super heavy engines began a flip maneuver. The booster's engines began relighting in pairs at T plus 249 seconds after liftoff. For a split second during the flip, all but one of the engines can be seen successfully reigniting on camera proving that the telemetry was accurate. The expedition up to this point had been proceeding almost without a hitch. But here's where everything started to go downhill. Something wasn't right as one of the central engines cut out mid-flip. More engines started failing as Booster 9 kept on with its boost back maneuver to get back to the Gulf of Mexico. Four engines had failed at timestamp T plus 257 seconds, while the remaining two kept going for another 14 seconds before they too gave up. During the broadcast, the telemetry wasn't in time with the rocket's movements. 
Manually sensing the two helped confirm our accuracy, and showed a sizable plume was produced by the failing engine. Another engine failed spectacularly releasing a massive burst, just three seconds later. As soon as that happened, another engine failed, and this time, there was visible debris flying from the engine compartment. There's an issue here at Starbase. Suddenly a small explosion caused three more engines to shut down, and only one remained ablaze. Unfortunately the booster detonated before we could fully comprehend what had just transpired. The goal of FDS is to puncture the rocket's fuel tanks, reduce thrust, and dispose of the propellant in a safe manner so that the flight can be ended. Though I was sad to see the booster go off, I was relieved to see that the mechanism engaged instantly this time. This should help get the investigation along much more quickly. The most pressing issue is still the failure's root cause. Without an official explanation, it is difficult to know why given how smooth the rise was. It's possible that the fuel sloshing induced by the flip maneuver allowed gas bubbles to enter the turbo pumps, resulting to combustion instability. Some have speculated that fuel sloshing occurred because the ship slowed the booster too much. In the best case situation this would force an engine shut down, but at its worst it may ignite an engine explosion, which seems to have been the case here. On the other side, the hot staging appeared to operate, and I don't think it was the cause of the super heavy detonation. How do you feel about it? Do you think the hot staging contributed to the problem or the engines? No whatever the reason, Jonathan McDowell's access to NOAA meteorological data shows that the FTS was triggered and Booster 9 was dispersed over the Gulf of Mexico. Ship 25, meanwhile, kept going full speed ahead with no obvious engine problems. There was hope that Ship 25 would make it to its near-orbital trajectory without any major damage for a while. The imbalance between methane and oxygen levels in the tanks was the only minor cause for alarm. At T plus 330 seconds, Ship 25 crossed the 100-kilometer barrier, the internationally acknowledged frontier of space, thereby making Starship a space-capable vehicle. For the following three and a half minutes, the engine burn continued without incident. At a height of 150 kilometers, however, a visible plume became apparent, and liquid oxygen levels began to drop dramatically. The cause of this oxygen deficiency could have been anything from a deliberate LOX release to a catastrophic collapse. In spite of this, the prototype's velocity was still growing, and all six engines were functioning normally. At T plus 736 seconds another plume was seen. Although telemetry showed that the engines were operating normally. At T plus 805 seconds, things took a turn for the worse, with the appearance of the greatest plume to date, and the Starship's apparent engine failure, which caused it to cease accelerating. Despite initial optimism that the prototype had just lost touch with Earth, the ship's destruction quickly became apparent from the final big cloud. SpaceX believes that the onboard computer recognized a serious malfunction with the prototype and automatically triggered the flight termination system. At that moment, the ship was merely a little dot in the sky, so identifying what exactly went wrong is practically difficult. Up until those sudden outbursts, the engine burn had been going smoothly. It's possible that the hot staging caused a small fire or that the lock tank burst under the pressure. A formal announcement is needed to either confirm or refute this speculation. The official broadcast didn't actually conclude the Ship 25 story. If you haven't already, you should follow the fantastic X account Astronomy Live. He made an effort to photograph the show from the Florida Keys, and it paid off magnificently. His recording begins just after the FTS is activated catching a once-in-a-lifetime occurrence. He took possession of Ship 25 as nose cone and cargo bay. One can easily make out the wingtips. This verifies that the FTS was engaged, but one could wonder why the nose cone section survived, and whether this raises any concerns for the FAA. Since the nose cone wasn't pressurized, and didn't have that much fuel in it, it probably survived the crash. If you notice a trail behind it, it's probably just the propellant leaking out of the header tanks. To destroy it, the whole thing would have to be wrapped with explosives. The FAA's top priority with the FDS is turning off the engine and letting the propellant spread out before the wreckage hits the ground. The Nozakoni's survival is probably not a significant concern because these charges aren't meant to destroy the entire prototype. But there's more to this than meets the eye. The ship didn't make it out of space in one piece, and its debris eventually had to fall back to Earth. Jonathan McDowell and NOAA confirmed that the reentry occurred near Puerto Rico. Somehow an ex-user who was present at the time captured what appears to be the re-entry of this debris. Even though it hasn't been confirmed, 
the timing and position are consistent with the nose cone part re-entering the atmosphere. What a string of fortunate events. It's astonishing how many fragments of data may be pieced together to produce a whole image. Now that the FTS has been activated, the FAA will be supervising SpaceX as they perform their investigation and ultimately authorize any necessary remedial measures. We can only hope that figuring out what went wrong won't be too time-consuming and can be quickly resolved. Concerning the place of the launch, important issues include Was the deflector shield effective? Did anything get broken? The only way to get these details was to go to the site. Highway 4 was surprisingly reopened within three hours after the launch, a positive sign that the aftermath was better than the last one. It seems like the orbital launch table is in decent shape. The water deflector survived with only a little bit of paint scraped off, and the deck doors were left in place this time around. It's possible that the table sensors and other internal components will need to be replaced after being subjected to the Raptor's extreme heat, but the external appearance suggests that the damage is limited. The launch tower itself also weathered well with only slight paint loss. The ship quick disconnect suffered the most damage shifting out of place ever so slightly as a result of the delayed retraction that occurred during takeoff. Fortunately, this appears to be a straightforward issue to resolve. The ground support equipment shells at the orbital tank farm show the most obvious signs of damage from the launch, with a few dents likely caused by the shock waves created during takeoff. They were already dented from the first launch, and dents are structural weak places. There is a large distance between these shells and the real tanks, therefore the impact will be minimal. The actual launch site is deceptively attractive. There is no concrete waste lying about, therefore there will be no tidying up to do. Despite widespread skepticism regarding the deflector system's capacity to halt all 33 Raptor engines, it performed flawlessly. At long last, there is a report on the deluge system that provides some intriguing observations from the Fish and Wildlife Service. The tanks supplying the deluge may hold up to 1.3 million liters or 358,000 gallons of water. Two launches, each using little more than 500,000 liters or 132,000 gallons of water would be possible with this amount. The nitrogen gas used to pressurize the system reaches a staggering 3,000 psi. Furthermore, it is projected that up to 92% of the consumed water will evaporate during a launch. The leftover liquid is stored in retention ponds until it passes environmental inspection and may be used again. Notably, the plate loses roughly 86 kilos or 190 pounds of steel with each launch. This indicates the need for periodic maintenance, which may seem insignificant in light of the massive size of the deflector. It takes around 72,000 gallons of water or 272,000 liters to put out a static fire during a booster test, and SpaceX can utilize the downpour up to 30 times each year. SpaceX is likely to begin rolling out Booster 10 and Ship 28 in the next couple of weeks, setting the stage for an IFT-3 launch in the first quarter of 2024, given the current status of the launch site. As we wrap up our journey today, a big thank you for joining us at Spaceverse. Your support fuels our cosmic exploration. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to keep exploring with us. Until our next cosmic encounter, see you.